Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you, Lord, that through him we have access to the Holy of Holies, to your very presence, oh God. And as your word says, the understanding of man, Lord, is limited. And what great things you have prepared for those who love you who are called according to your purpose. So Lord, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your spirit. We pray, Father, I pray a blessing upon your people. Guard our hearts. Help us, O Lord, to guard our hearts and our words carefully uh, today in Yeshua's name. Amen. The Torah portion uh, today is out of my part of it, at least, is out of Leviticus chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, and it talks about the tabernacle of the congregation. And the word that's used here is the Hebrew word ochel, and it means a tent or a covering. It means a temporary structure that can be taken down and set up and moved from place to place. And uh, you know, that reminds us that uh, there's other words not only in the Old Testament or the First Testament, as I like to call it, but also in the New Covenant that speaks of our bodies as being a tent or a temporary dwelling upon this earth. And I can tell you, I can sure tell I'm not 20 years old anymore. And I, can, I can understand how temporary it, it's becoming. I want to talk about the tabernacle or the temple today. The temple and the articles as I see it, the temple and the articles within the temple are a pattern to guide us to find peace with God and to have intimate, personal relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And isn't that, that, that's what it's all about? Is, isn't that what it's all about? Is knowing Him Come on. Knowing His power, having fellowship with Him, communing with Him and He with you, isn't that what it's all about? So the temple and the articles in the temple, I believe they are a road map to show us the way to the tabernacle that God Almighty pitched, the eternal temple. And find sweet fellowship with Him. Not only forever and eternity, but I believe we can have a little piece of heaven right here on earth. Amen. I believe we can have fellowship right now because the Bible is full of examples of men and women who have intimate, close, personal relationship with the God of Israel. And that's what it's all about. So I want to talk about the temple today. And I want to look at the temple as a figure or as an example of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies. And indeed, Rabbi Paul of Tarsus in his letter to the believers at Corinth refers to the temple of God in this way. And I'm going to be using a lot of scripture today. And uh, if you want to jot these down, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First of all, and look at this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Rabbi Paul of Tarsus says, Know you not that you are the temple of God? Who's he talking to? He's talking to you and me. This word is good for us today. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And he goes on to say, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That sounds like serious business to me. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, and to give you a little bit of background on why Rabbi Paul wrote this letter to the believers at Corinth, these, 
He had went there on one of his missionary journeys. He had established a congregation. But some of these folks were involved in some really serious worldly sins. They were... Uh, I mean, some of these folks were even going to the pagan temples and, and uh, being in union with the temple prostitutes, both female and male, by the way, I believe, if I remember correctly. They were lawsuits. They were suing each other. They were, there was incest within the, this country. I mean, it was, it was horrible. And it's, I heard somebody say, we need to go back to the, the uh, early... I don't know if we do or not. But that was part of Paul's reasons, reason for writing this letter. And in verse 16, Paul says, what? He says, what? I can't believe you guys are acting this way. What? Don't you know that your body, Paul says, is the temple of of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, verse 19, excuse me, and you are not your own. That's right. I, hear, I hear young people say sometimes today, it's my body. Well, not if you belong to the Lord. It's not your body. Amen. Come on, man. Amen. That's right. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which belong to God. And then one more reference is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What agreement, this is Rabbi Paul again, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, he says, and be separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Sounds like an intimate relationship, doesn't it? Sounds like a family. Mm -hmm. Come on. And so the temple and the tabernacle is a road map to show us the way to find intimate peace and a personal relationship with Almighty God, the Creator of the universe. Amen. Now, the temple of God in the Tanakh consisted of three main parts. And I'll just, I'm going to briefly touch on these. This is not an in-depth in -depth study. There was the outer court, there was the holy place, and then there was the Holy of Holies, the Most Holy Place. Three main parts. And Paul, over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he says, I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. So there it is. We are made in the image of God, Father, Son, in the spirit, Paul says, your whole soul, spirit, soul, and body. Three parts. And so I believe the temple has something to say to us. Because the temple consisted of three main parts. Now, as we approach the temple, I want to take a walk through the temple today. And take a journey through the temple. And the end result is to find personal peace with God an intimate relationship with Him and communion with Him. That's the goal as we take our journey through the temple today. As we approach the temple, the first thing we see is the outer court. The outer court was roughly 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. And as we go into the outer court, the first thing that we come upon is the altar of burnt offering. And between the altar of burnt offering and the tent of meeting or the holy place is the laver or that was a large basin of water. Sometimes I think King Solomon referred to it as the sea. And so the outer court, as I see it, represents our physical bodies. When you look at me, 
when you look at this old man with no hair this morning, you can't see my spirit, you can't see my mind or my psyche, but what you see is the outer court, the body. And what happened there on the altar of burnt offering? What did they do? They offered sacrifices. They offered sacrifices to God. And Paul says in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable Amen. unto God, which is our reasonable service. And that word reasonable means logical. When you think about what God did for you and what He did for me and the price that was paid to purchase our redemption, it's logical Amen. that we present our bodies as a living That's sacrifice. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't just do anything you want to do. No, you can't. You can't talk any way you want to talk. Because your body belongs to the King, beloved. Amen. The King who laid down His life for right. you and I. You were bought with a price. You know, Paul referred to himself many times in the New Covenant as a bond slave of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. You know where that comes from? It comes back from the law of Moses. If a slave, he had a good master, he had a family, maybe he had children, he wanted to stay in that household forever until he died. The priest would bore a hole in his ear through a doorpost. And he was marked for life. He was a bond slave. And that's the image that Paul gives us. I'm not my own. I'm a bond slave to Yeshua now. He purchased me. My body belongs to him. And Paul said in another place that I bear the, my body the marks of Yeshua on the side. Remember that? Well, anyway, I think sometimes it's really hard for us who were born in America to really get a handle on what this means when Paul says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are not your own. Because here in America, we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of movement. We can move around from city to city and state to state. We don't have to show papers to do it. We have freedom to pursue life, liberty, and to pursue happiness. We have freedom to choose our own career. We have freedom to vote to whoever we will want to vote for or for whoever we want to vote for. We have all these freedoms. And so it's hard for us as Americans sometimes, I think, to really get a handle on what Paul is saying. Living in the kingdom of God is not a democracy. You understand that? You understand what it means to follow Yeshua? I think we have to and we need to if we're going to find intimate, personal relationship with God and peace with God. You know, the subjects of the king live under the king's authority. We saw a perfect example of that just a few minutes ago when Jerry Jane said, I want to be a singer, I want to be a dancer, but what did God say? Your body belongs to me once you in the kitchen down there. Mm -hmm. See what that means? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what it means? Come on. And the king says to his subjects, to this person, you go do this. And to another person, go do that. And to one, go here. And to another, go there. Because you belong to the king. Mm -hmm. We are under his authority if you really know him. And that's what Yeshua meant, I believe, when He said, He that saves His life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake and the good news, the same shall find it. Do you understand the cost to follow Yeshua? Yeah. I'm trying to think of a better way to explain it. <coughs> We belong to the King. And having said that, when we submit our lives
to the king as Lord, as master. He becomes responsible to take care of us. He then becomes responsible to meet our needs. You remember the words of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 6? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you. You know, I, I, guess, uh, I guess I could say if it was easy, everybody would do it. But you should have said, you're going to take up the cross and follow me. What, what, what is a tree of sacrifice? It's just that. It's a tree of sacrifice. You don't get to have your way anymore. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which belong to God. And then as priest, through Yeshua's blood, as priest of God, the next thing we do is we wash our bodies in the labor or in the sea. That's what, the, that's what the priest did in the first covenant. Read the stories there in the Torah, the law of Moses. And see how the priests would wash themselves as they ministered or before they ministered in the temple. I believe this has to do with our sanctification. It has to do with saying, Lord, here's my body. Now, now you show me what you want me to do. Is that me, Daryl? I thought I got the good one today. <laughs> but it has to do with setting ourselves apart to the service of the great king. Cleansing ourselves. Washing ourselves. But in a nutshell, our bodies belong to God. Now let's, let's look at a verse over in Hebrews chapter 10. Now I think this will explain what I'm talking about. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart. He's talking about drawing near to God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Isn't that a perfect picture of what's going on in the tabernacle? Setting our lives apart for the king, service of the king. Be the, I mean, if God's called you to be a teacher, be the best teacher you can be to the his glory. God's called you to work in the kitchen, do it for His glory. If God's called you to be a construction worker, if that's your calling, do it to the glory of God. If you're a doctor, do it to the glory of God. If you're a preacher, you better be doing it to the glory of God. Whatever it is, the station that God directs you in in life, do it for His glory. You know, our, speaking of our bodies, the Bible says that our feet can run to do evil. I believe over in the, David talked about that. Their feet run, run to do evil. Their throats and open sepulcher. The poison of ass is, that's snakes by the way, is under their tongues. But you know, as servants of the king, we can use our feet to bring good news. We can use our feet and somebody say, I'm in a terrible mess and you can say, I've got good news for you. Because you do. You can set your feet upon a solid rock or you can stand on sinking sand. Well, I'm telling you, 
the things that we see today, did you ever think that in America there would be an issue with which bathroom you had to use? The truths and the policies of man are constantly changing. Constantly. Who knows what the truth is? It may be true today, but tomorrow it may not be true. But the king, beloved, the king, it says that his word abides forever. It's forever settled in heaven. It's truth, as the philosopher Plato once said, it's truth with a capital T. It is the truth. It never changes. Never changes. It's always the same. Now your hands. Your hands can work mischief. Or you can lift up your hands to honor God. And to praise Him. You can lay your hands on the sick and pray for healing. Yes. In the hands of the King, the Bible says, David said that he trains my fingers and hands to war. Can be instruments of warfare. Amen. Glory to God. And then there's another member of the body that's the most troublesome. James chapter 3. Some of you that know anything about the Bible know where we're going. <laughs> My brethren, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive a greater condemnation. For in many things we offend God, but if any man offend not more, the same as a perfect man or a complete man. I don't think it necessarily means sinless, but a complete man and also able to control the whole body. This member, the tongue, is the key to having success in life. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. It's the key to having success in life. Yes. It really is the way I see it. James goes on, he says, and talks about Horses. You know, a horse is a, is a big, powerful animal. How much do they weigh, Ronnie? A ton? 50? 1,200 pounds? Some of those big Clydesdales may, may go more than that. But how do you control that horse? With a little bit in its mouth. You can make it go one way or make it go the other way. And James says that the tongue is like that. It, James goes on to say, and I won't read this whole passage, he says, so is the tongue among our members, but it can defile the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And you ought to read James chapter 3 when you go home. We won't take the time to do it today. But you know, your shield has some things to say about the tongue too. I wonder sometimes, do we really understand what it means to walk in the steps <coughs> of our Master and our King, our example? Because as she was said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. The Bible talks about being conformed to His image, following in His steps. Do we really understand? You know, James says if, if we offend not more the same as a perfect man, there's another way you can look at that because everything that she have said was perfect. Sure. He was a perfect man. He was without sin. When he, there's a principle there we need to get a hold of, I think. Mm -hmm. But Yeshua said, you have heard that it was said by the old old time, he quotes from the law of Moses, you should not murder. If you have King James, it says kill, but that word really means murder. I looked it up to make sure. And whosoever shall murder shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, are you ready for this? Have you ever read this before any, any of you? That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, without a just cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means useless, shall be in danger of the council of the Sanhedrin there, I believe is what that refers to. 
But whosoever shall say you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. And that word fool, believe it or not, I checked this out with Strong's, the Strong said blockhead. <laughs> That's what it said. That's what Strong said. It means the, the Amplified translates this word fool as being an empty headed idiot. See? Now, I didn't say this. If you control that member below your nose, if I could do that, I'm not perfect either. Don't, I mean, don't look at me and say, boy, I want to be like Pastor Gene. No, you don't. read last night, I believe in Psalm 73 when I got home. How the wicked say, the wicked men who rebel against God, they say our words are our own. Our tongue is our own. Who hears? That's the wicked men. But the man of God and the woman of God will bring that member under the control of a king, the great king and his spirit. James says that no man can tame the tongue, and that's true. But I'll tell you, the king can, with the help of his spirit, the spirit of the living God. Yes, sir. Well, I think we get the picture that our bodies are not our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your bodies and in your spirit. He owns, the king owns our bodies. Now, the next thing we see in our walk through the temple is the holy place. As I see it, the holy place symbolizes the soul or the mind. David said in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And that word soul can also be translated mind. How can we bless God with our minds? And that's a necessary step too, is to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. God wants us to be. You know, after Paul, Rabbi Paul said in Romans 12, he said, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. He says that the next thing he says is not, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by what? The renewing of your minds. So I believe the holy place represents the mind. Now there are three articles in the holy place. Placed in front of the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place is the altar of incense. Aaron the high priest was to burn incense on it twice a day in the morning and in the evening when he dressed the lamps. Exodus chapter 30, verse 7. <clears throat> and Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps, at evening he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. According to the New Covenant, as I understand the Bible, I certainly don't know everything, but I can read. I believe the incense represents the prayers of the saints. When is the last time you really prayed, beloved? I'm not talking about just Thank you, Lord, for the food. Blessed be you, O Lord, our God. I'm talking about really praying. When's the last time you got along with God and had communion with Him? You know, we can use the pattern of the Amidah prayer, morning and evening. I believe also it's important to have a personal time of prayer. To pray for your needs, to pray for others, to pray for your grandkids that are doing the things that we did when we were that age. Prayer does change things. Man, I've seen it happen so many times. I can't. I could. I could write a book that thick on how God intervened and, and changed situations. He can even change somebody's heart, and you won't even have to say a word sometimes. Prayer is important. In Revelation, I, I just want to show you where I got this from. Revelation chapter 8. 
I'll begin at verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now isn't that a picture of the altar of incense? It is to me. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials or bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So that's why I say I believe the altar of incense represents the prayers of the saints. We need to pray. And if we do it according to the example given in the temple, it's morning and evening. Begin. I, I, I'm not trying to, I mean, for me, I, I think it's important to begin your day with prayer and to end your day with prayer yes. before you lay down. Sometimes it brings, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to lay down in peace. Yeshua said, Men ought always to pray and faint not. Rabbi Paul of Tarsus said, Pray without ceasing. The mind, the mind, we want to renew the mind. Don't think like we used to think. Don't act like we used to act. Don't, don't have the old attitudes. Well, I used to have an attitude. It wasn't the right kind. And I jokingly say sometimes that I used to think I knew everything. And after I married Darlene, she assured me that that was not the case. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that, honey. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Inside the holy place is the table of showbread. It was on the north side of the holy place. There were 12 loaves of bread placed in two rows, six cakes in each row. And a reference for that, if you want to jot that down, is Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. And it was to be set in order on the table every Sabbath. And it was to be eaten only by the priest who served in the temple. And what does that represent? You know, I might be wrong about this, but I, I believe it represents the living bread that came down from heaven and feeding upon Him daily, depending upon Him, trusting Him daily, walking with Him daily. You know, Yeshua said, or He prayed one time, give us this day our daily bread. And I think probably He was talking about our our physical needs and our daily needs there, but I think it runs deeper than that as I see it. Because in John chapter 6, in verse 30, he was having a, a debate or a conversation with some of the Jewish people, and, he, and they said unto him, What sign do you show us that we may see and believe in you? What kind of work will you show us? What kind of work will you do so we can believe in you? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written in Exodus 16, verse 15. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Yeshua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. And then skipping down to verse 47, Yeshua goes on and He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on Me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and they are dead. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven that if a man eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If a man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is My flesh which I will give for the life of the world. So I believe the showbread 
may represent Yeshua in our daily dependence upon Him, spending time with Him, trusting Him, ever mindful of all the situations that come our way during the day, being ever mindful of His principles and His commandments and His directives for our lives. And I believe that when Yeshua prayed, give us this day our daily bread, I think He was speaking of more than just food. Because He goes on to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except, a man, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. <coughs> Whosoever eats My flesh and drinks My blood has eternal life, I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that feeds on me, even he shall live by me. And this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate man and are dead. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. Amen. And that's why, beloved, it's so important to me. I mean, it's so important to have some kind of consistent basis. I, don't, I mean, I do it daily, but you know, but, but you need to have some kind of consistent basis to spend time reading God's love letters to us. Because I believe that's what they are. Don't try to learn everything at once. Just read. You know, when I was in college, when I would get ready for an exam, I wouldn't wait till the night before like a lot of kids did. Because I was kind of a neurotic anyway. So I would, I would start studying, or I wouldn't really study, but I would start two weeks before the test came. And I wouldn't try to remember everything. All I did was just read over, over my notes, read them over, read through them over and over and over again. And about the fifth or sixth time, I, I, I'd know everything. But when test time came, I already knew it. That's kind of the way it is. You're not going to understand everything, and don't try to. But just pray for the Lord's guidance in reading. And some of it's going to stick by accident, right. if nothing else. Yeah. Right. Paul, Rabbi Paul, in one of his letters, said, Let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly with all wisdom. All wisdom. And I'll tell you, the more you read, the more you find out you don't know. But it just keeps getting deeper and deeper, <laughs> layer upon layer. <clears throat> and first thing you know, your mind's going to start being renewed. You're going to start thinking different, I'm acting different. Now, the third thing in the holy place is the golden lampstand along the south wall of the holy place. And I believe this represents the Spirit of God. I think I read that a while ago, but we'll read it again. 5, Revelation 5, 6. And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto the, all the earth. So I believe the, the lampstand with its seven lamps, I believe it represents the illumination of God's spirit into our lives. Mm. As we read. And Rabbi Storch reminded me this morning, I believe if I remember it, Rabbi Jeremy, David said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my feet. <coughs> and David has some more things to say about that too. In Psalm 36, listen to what David says. <clears throat> Verse 9 For with you, with thee, is the fountain of life. In thy light, we shall see light. In thy light, we shall see light. What's he talking about? I believe he's talking about the illumination of God's Spirit. You know, he shows us things sometimes. You know, I've read, I've been reading the Bible for over 30 years. That doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean anything. But I, I will say this. 
passages that I read years ago that I didn't have a clue. I said, God, I don't know what that means. I have, I have no idea. Now, what, one day or one night you'll read that and boom, the Holy Spirit's going to shed light on that and you're going to say, wow. Amen. Wow, now I can connect the dots better. In Psalm 43, verse 3, again, he says, O oh, send out thy light and thy truth, and let them lead me. Let them bring me into thy holy hill, into thy tabernacle. <coughs> the illumination of God's Spirit. All three of these things are important in the renewing of our minds. As we feed on Yeshua daily, Praying and fixing our minds upon the King's words and the King's principles. I'm telling you, folks, I know it sounds like a broken record, but it will change your life. It will. Now, the last stop in the temple is the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. This is our goal, isn't it? As we've started our journey through the tabernacle, this is our ultimate goal, is to find sweet fellowship and communion with Almighty God. Men have died for that. You know that? You know, we never hear anything on the news about this, but I've read in the voice of martyrs that, by the way, the voice of martyrs was founded by a Jewish believer. Person, I can't remember his last name, Richard, uh, begins, his last name begins with a B. But he said from 100,000 up to 300,000 believers or Christians a year are martyred for the name of Yeshua. How come we don't ever hear anything about that in this country? I can tell you why, because the forces of darkness are, well, we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray that the right person is going to be elected this That's November. Right. That's, this is our goal, though, to be into the Holy of Holies. And the Bible says in Exodus 25, I think I'm going to read that because I did read it last night, but I think I should. In Exodus 25, this is the place in the Holy of Holies where we find sweet communion with God. That's the goal. In Exodus 25, beginning at verse 21, and you shall put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there, and there I will meet with you, and there I will commune with you from above the mercy seat and between the two cherubim. You can go and read the rest of that. But it's there in the Holy of Holies that God communes with His people. And what does that represent? I believe, believe the Holy of Holies is a picture of the Spirit in the heart of God's people. You know, David, you know, the Holy of Holies is rather a secret place. That you, nobody was allowed in there except the high priest once a year. He came with blood. Life of the flesh is in the blood I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes the atonement for your souls. And he had to come with blood. And he only could come in once a year. Because it was a secret place. And you know, David, I, that, last night as I was thinking, you know, I, uh, it reminded me of King David and, and what he said about the secret place of God. In Psalm chapter 25, if you want to jot it down. <clears throat> Verse 14, I believe it is. David says, The secret of the Lord. Isn't that precious? Isn't that precious? The secret of the Lord is with them. And he will show them his covenant. It is with them that fear his name. He will show them his covenant. And then again in Psalm 27. Uh, David had some wonderful things to say in verse 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. The secret place. I don't think he's talking about the temple where he stood then. I think he's talking about the true tabernacle in heaven. 
He shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And then in one more, one of my very favorite, Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place, the Holy of Holies. That's just you and God, beloved. That's just you and God alone. Is it worth the effort? I believe it is. I believe it is. I believe it is. Well, there we are. We've completed our journey. When we offer our bodies, living sacrifice, we sanctify our, our bodies, our minds are transformed and renewed. With the help of God's Spirit through prayer, through feeding on the King's Word, I believe we're in a position then to find intimate peace and fellowship with Almighty God. And we're in a position to hear His voice. To hear His voice. To hear His voice. To speak to Him. In the time of trouble, David said, if you hadn't had any lately, just get ready, you're going to. Because you should have promised it. In the world you will have tribulation. But, he said, be of good cheer. Amen. I have overcome. That's right. Well, that's what David said, wasn't it? Hallelujah. In a time of trouble, he will hide me in the secret place of his people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. As you said, my sheep hear my voice. I'd just like to say to you today, I'm going to close with one. One last passage in Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll get in and be quiet. But i just like to say to you, may you all today, everyone here who names the name of Yeshua, as our Messiah, as our King, our Redeemer, our Healer, our God, our Comfort, our Salvation, our Deliverer, our Hope, mm. our Peace, our Provider, mm. everyone that names His name, I pray today that your journey would be prosperous and successful yeah. to go into the Holy of Holies and find yeah. intimate yeah. fellowship and peace yeah. with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to what Paul prays here in Ephesians 1 to the believers at Ephesus. He's not only praying for them, but I believe he's praying for me and for you. He says, Therefore, after I heard of your faith, in Yeshua our Lord, and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's what he prayed. That the God of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of your understanding being illuminated See, let's see these principles, how they run through the Scripture? That you may know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in the Messiah when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. It sure sounds like intimate relationship to me in Revelation. That's what he wants. May your journey today through this life be prosperous and successful as you seek to enter into the Holy of Holies. God bless you all. Thank you so much.
Hallelujah. And once again, if you love the Lord, let's give him a great big clap. Off. Yeah. 